Good morning and welcome to morning worship here at John Calvin Presbyterian Church in Metairie, Louisiana. We are delighted that you have joined us for services today. I would direct you to the church website, John Calvin Presbyterian Church website, for announcements and items of interest for the congregation. If you would like to in any way support the work of John Calvin Presbyterian Church and are not a member of the church, please feel free to make any donation that you might like to make to the ministry of the church and it will be applied in a faithful and in um, an effective manner for the work of Jesus Christ in this community. I'm delighted that we are assisted today once again by my colleagues in worship, uh, Sandy Cranfill, Julie Etlin, and Julie Aber. And I give thanks for the continued assistance of David Garland and those who are helping him with the production of this service. Now, let us worship God. If you haven't already done so, please go to the church website and either download the call to worship and print it out or just look at it on your computer as we continue to worship God. Next in our order of worship is our section on adoration and the call to worship from the 68th Psalm. O kingdoms of the earth, Sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, to the one who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. O God, your son, Jesus prayed for his disciples and sent them into the world to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. By your Holy Spirit, hold the church in unity and keep it faithful to your word so that we may be one with Christ in faith and love and service now and forever. Amen.
I now direct your attention to the call to confession, the prayer of confession, the assurance of pardon, followed by the proclamation and the first lesson. The grace of God overflows for us through Christ Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners. Let us confess our sin. Merciful God, you pardon who tr all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Do not cast us away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore us to the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Therefore, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson is from the first chapter of Acts, verses 6 through 14. And this is the story, somewhat familiar to us, in general quite familiar, of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. This Sunday being in close proximity to the day each year that we remember and observe the ascension of Jesus into heaven. So let us hear now this story as it comes to us from the first chapter of Acts. So when they had come together, the disciples, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will, will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now it is time for our children's message and Julie Abair. Good morning. 
The title of our children's message is Finishing the Work. Mary Cassett is an artist who lived in the 1800s. Although she never married and had no children, she enjoyed painting pictures of mothers and children. Here is an example of one of her paintings. I don't know if you can see it, but <laughs> it's a picture of a mother holding a child. See how closely the mother and child are to each other? The mother holds the child and child's hand and kisses it. You can see and feel the love these two have for each other. Can you imagine if this picture did not have the mother in the painting? Can you imagine if this picture did not have the child in the painting? No, the picture would not seem complete. It wouldn't be finished. The artist Mary Cassett worked on this painting and the mother and child showed expression, the colors, the lights, the background, all in harmony. She worked until those viewing the painting can feel what is happening in the picture. It is a complete work of art. Art like this can be a way of bringing honor to God. When Jesus was on earth, he prayed to God and said, I glorified you on the earth. I have accomplished the work which you had given me to do. The work that Jesus was given to do while he was on, word, on earth was to show God's love. He did that in many ways. He performed miracles. He healed the sick. And giving his life for us. He honored God by remaining here until his work was finished. We all have special work to do. As you are growing and becoming an adult, it is important that you find what, do you, what you are meant to do. One of your friends might want to become a teacher. Another may want, want to be a business owner. One might want to be a truck driver. Another, an artist. Through our work, we all have the opportunity to honor God. No matter what we choose to do in this world, there is always a way of honoring God while you're doing it. Bye, guys.
Our second lesson is from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Let us hear now the Word of God. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made known your name to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things to the world so that they may have my joy so that they may have my joy, may complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Without a doubt, one of the most moving passages in all of Scripture is the so-called high priestly prayer found in the book of the Gospel of John, which is in part our text for this morning from the 17th chapter. On the night of his arrest and in full knowledge of what lay ahead, Jesus tenderly, intimately speaks with his disciples and speaks with his Father. It is a prayer found only in John. The other three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, also have Jesus praying on the night of his arrest. But this prayer from Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the prayer from the Garden of Gethsemane, which John does not include. First, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the setting is different. It is in Gethsemane as opposed to the upper room, which is the setting for John's prayer. But there's even a bigger difference in tone and content that I think is important for us to consider. 
Unlike the high priestly prayer which we have before us today from the Gospel of John, the garden prayer is one of dread and anguish. Jesus poignantly dreading his fate. Some of you perhaps remember the Broadway play, Jesus Christ Superstar. I sure remember it from my youth. It was quite a hit and some wonderful songs out of this play. At the 11th hour in the part of the play that I remember, the character of, Je character of Jesus pathetically pleads with God for a stay of execution. He sings, take this cup away from me, for I don't want to taste its poison. Feel it burn me. That's the garden prayer. It is different from the prayer that we have before us today. Today's prayer from John has none of the pain and pathos of the garden prayer. The Jesus we meet today has by now considered and rejected a last minute appeal to God. Amazingly, he has moved from wretched anguish to full acceptance of his fate. How? How could he have done this? Where the, well, there can only be one reason. He is in full confidence. He is full of confidence because he has already, already overcome the world and he knows it. Effectively, his work is done, and this he says to God. As a result, what will follow will be a serene, even victorious Jesus who goes to meet his captors. Renowned child psychiatrist Eric Erickson said that at the end of a person's life, he or she looks back on what they've made of their lives either with a sense of despair because nothing more can be done or with gratitude and satisfaction over the life they have led. This morning, as he awaits his fate, Jesus has this sense of satisfaction, rightfully so. What remains is death, but you kind of get the idea that that's all that remains for him. Poet Emily Dickinson once said, I will die, but that is all that I will do for death. This is Jesus' state of mind then as we eavesdrop on his meeting with the Twelve, and for the first time we are clued into his overall philosophy about human life. The important clue comes by way of a single word that occurs no less than seven times in today's reading. In Greek, the word is didomi. In English, didomi is translated gift. Jesus' philosophy is the theme of today's sermon. And that philosophy is this. Life is a gift from God. So then I'm at the dentist's office this week and I'm getting my teeth worked on and the dentist says, what are you preaching about this Sunday? Why do dentists bother to ask you questions when they've got all this equipment in your mouth and you can't say anything. So I go, wah, 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 wah. and she takes all of the instruments out and she said, what was that? I said, I said, I'm preaching on the fact that life is a gift, I said. And then she stuck everything back in my mouth and replied, yeah, sometimes it comes in a big box with a bright bow and sometimes in a brown paper bag. I really don't know what she meant by that, but that's what she said. Life is a gift. We hear this said all the time. We say it ourselves. But how fully do we believe it? 
how fully do we put it into practice? How does it guide our actions and our behavior? We thank God, for example, for the gift of the day, but rather than open it up and put it to use, we treat this gift of the day as if it were some kind of challenge to take on. So go out and take on the day, we hear it said. We thank God for the stuff that he has given us, our spiritual gifts and and our abilities, the things that make us unique. But instead of developing those gifts and abilities and making something out of them, we use them, we find fault with them. We find ways of wasting our talents. We complain about our lives. Jesus says to God about his disciples then and now, They were yours, and you gave them to me. This is what Jesus says. The the they being his disciples. He's talking about us here. You. They. Us. Belong to God. Given to Christ. Given back to God. Eugene Peterson, who has this wonderful translation of scripture called The Message, and I commend it to you, translates this passage as follows. I pray for them, for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. There you have it in black and white. We do not come from ourselves. We are not self-made. We are God-made. We belong to God. All that we have, our lives, our fortunes, our intellect, everything, we owe to God. And yet sometimes we behave as if it were just the opposite. But you know, people of faith have not always been of this mind. Philip Yancey, who's a wonderful biblical scholar, notes that the pages of the Old Testament fairly resound with the message that this world revolves around God and not around us. He writes, the Hebrews had incessant reminders built into their culture. They dedicated their firstborn livestock and children to God. They wore portions of the law on their heads and wrists. They posted visible reminders on their doorways. They said the word blessed a hundred times a day, even wore peculiar hairstyles and sewed tassels on their garments to remind them of God, a devout Jew could barely make it through an hour, let alone an entire day, he writes, without running smack into some reminder that he or she lived in God's world. The world, the Hebrews believed, is God's property. Life is a gift from God. The renowned preacher William Sloan Coffin, who for many years was pastor of New York City's Riverside Church, once remarked that one of the most unsettling acts a person could perform would be to stand up in the middle of a board of directors meeting of a large corporation and read the first verse of Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's. And all there is in it. The moment you and I fully understand this truth. The earth is the Lord's. And all that is in it. The moment we fully embrace it. As did Jesus every moment of his life. 
is the moment you and I begin living life with joy and thanksgiving. Isn't that what we want? Well, this is how. To recognize that our lives are gifts from God. Life in Christ then begins with gratitude. Just for our existence. So as the old hymn says, let's count our blessings. If we do, says Garrison Keillor, we will break through the thin membrane of sourness and sullenness and come into the light and enjoy our essential robustness and good health. Count your blessings. Life, your life, is a gift from God. The good news is that we do not belong to ourselves but to God. And this is always good news, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the circumstances of this day, as challenging and difficult as they are. Literary critic Wilfred Sheed, who died a few years back, contracted polio at the age of 13. A budding athlete, for the rest of his life, he had to walk with, the, with a cane, with the assistance of a cane. But this did nothing to diminish his enthusiasm for life. Listen to him. People who have magically been handed the whole package, the whole package, a complete set of both limbs and senses have been known to mope around the house as if they're still missing something and to worry themselves sick about happiness. An old polio hand is likely to lose patience with these people, perhaps too quickly, and just shout out, why don't you just shut up and go dancing or play softball or wave your legs in the air? And I suppose that you would lose patience, he goes on, even more if you were blind and everyone else could see. How could anyone be unhappy with a pair of good eyes? And why would anyone ever consider a pill or drink necessary to these delights? Wilfred Sheed was a happy person, content and satisfied and productive and led a life of great fulfillment despite the fact that he used a cane. He knew that his life was a gift. Life itself, existence, is a gift. It's a wonderful gift because it's life. The good news is that we do not belong to ourselves, but to a loving and gracious providential God who may be counted on to work out his purpose in and through the events of history and the actions of human beings, no matter what. One of my favorite stories comes from the mid-1600s in Europe, and especially in Germany, which was plunged into a 30-year religious war. A young man named Martin Rinkert was pastor of a Lutheran church in Eilenburg, Germany. Famine and deadly disease raged through the land. The population of Germany went from 16 million to 6 million. In 1637, Martin Rinkert conducted funerals for almost 4,500 people in that single year in his parish, who died in an epidemic that swept his city. He was the only surviving pastor in his community. Grave diggers refused to dig because of the disease, so Martin Rinkert would dig many of the graves himself. One of those graves was for his beloved wife. And yet, and yet, Martin Rinkert was moved every day to give thanks to God. In the middle of the worst of what he faced, each day of that wretched time, 
We cannot even imagine how tough and awful it was for him. But each of those days, he took a moment to remember the generosity of God. Yes, the providence of God. He remembered Jesus Christ. He remembered the cross of Christ and what it meant for him. He remembered the word made flesh and gratitude invariably bubbled up with joy from within him. It is Martin Rinkert, you see, who wrote these famous lines that we sing every Thanksgiving. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices. Every moment, every day, this day, this moment, your life, gift from God. Gil McGregor was an All-American forward for Wake Forest University's Demon Deacons basketball team in the late 1960s early 1970s. He grew up in Rayford, North Carolina, the son of parents who instilled in him a devotion to God and an appreciation for human life. An African-American, he faced untold discrimination throughout his playing days. He, in fact, was among the first African-Americans to play in the Atlantic Coast Conference and as such was subjected to abuse and taunts from racist fans wherever he went. But he never allowed this to define him. Instead, he saw himself continually as a child of God imbued by his creator with particular and wondrous gifts and abilities, athletic abilities, and his job, as he would put it often, was to take what God had given him and to develop it further. Gil would go on to play professionally, then serve as television analyst for the Charlotte Hornets, then the New Orleans Hornets, and then the Pelicans for a brief while. He was a former member of the church that I once served in New Orleans, and thus I had the privilege of being Gil McGregor's pastor for a few years. He and I would have lunch from time to time, and on one such occasion I asked him what it was like enduring the ugliness of racial discrim discrimination. He thought for a moment, and then he said that he had a choice each day to make, whether to be bitter or whether to be better. Gil McGregor moved back to North Carolina shortly after Hurricane Katrina. And about that time, he gradually began losing his eyesight due to glaucoma. He's almost completely blind now. But true to form, it has not held him back, and he has made the adjustments. And now he is a sought-after motivational speaker. He said, some people haven't been able to see their whole lives but I was able to see for most of mine. So now it's just about making adjustments. I've always been a positive person, he said, and that will never change. We're not talking here about any reality denying ethereal existence. Life is difficult and acknowledging its challenges and hardships, including the challenge to recognize and to confront evil when we see it, is part of the deal. What we are talking about, though, is the invitation to you and to me to see and embrace what we have been given, our present, no matter what, no matter what we are going through, no matter how painful, as part of of our very imperfect human condition from which God is not 
devoid and out of which God promises blessings beyond measure. I love G.K. Chesterton, the English essayist, theologian, writer, critic. He was someone who inspired greatly C.S. Lewis. Many of you have read C.S. Lewis through the years. Well, Lewis is a protege in many ways of G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton once said, Men spoke much in my boyhood of restricted or ruined men of genius. And it was common to say that many a man was a great might have been. To me, he said, it is a more solid and startling fact that any man in the street is a great might not have been. (laughs) The very fact of our existence that we are alive is a fact worth celebrating. It's a miracle in and of itself, this day, that we are alive. It's a gift from God. (laughs) I served this little small church in eastern North Carolina many years ago before moving to the New Orleans area. And I would go in every Sunday morning early and go back to the kitchen where a few of the men would sit around the coffee pot and drink coffee and talk and visit and catch up. There was a certain guy there named Gwen. I can't think of his last name. I wouldn't even tell you if if I did know, just to protect the innocent. Gwen. And every Sunday I would say, well, Gwen, how are you doing? And he would say with a chuckle, well, I looked at the obituaries today and my name wasn't in it, so I guess I'm okay. Every single Sunday he said this. It made you want to blurt out, Gwen, can't you come up with something better than that? Well, no. No, actually. What could be better than that? The very fact that this day we are alive. Which means that at the end of this day, it will not be what we did not get done that will matter. It really won't even matter what we got done, as important as that may be. What ultimately matters is that we were. That we are. Albert Einstein once said, there are two ways to live. You can live as if nothing is a miracle, and you can live as if everything is a miracle. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed, which is in today's order of worship. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us look to God in prayer. And conclude the prayer with the praying together of the Lord's Prayer. Almighty God, you taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for others. Hear us as we pray for people in need.
Lord, visit the whole of your church with your power and your unity and your peace. Come upon us with your Holy Spirit that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we may obey your word and live together in unity. Lord, we pray for the nations of the world. Lead and guide and inspire those who govern that they may rule fairly and maintain order. Lift up those in need, especially those who are sick, those who are unemployed, those who are grieving, who have lost loved ones, who are worried about the outcome of the illnesses of loved ones. Hold these people in your arms, your powerful arms. Put them in the palm of your hand that they may know that no matter what, you are with them, empowering them, and that they will always be in your good care and keeping. Awaken all people to the ways that we neglect to remember you and the ways that we neglect to remember the greatest commandment to love one another. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacraments and deeds of mercy that by their teaching and example, they may reveal your love. <clears throat> Bring to your remembrance and to our remembrance, dear God, all those who having served you here on earth now live eternally with you. We give you thanks for our saints and we remember with gratitude their example. And look forward to the day when we are all together in your wonderful presence in eternity. May their endurance give us courage and faithfulness for the living of these days. And now, dear God, we commend to you ourselves, our church, our families, our friends, our community, our nation, and our world. Look with compassion on us. To you we give glory, O blessed Trinity, now and forever. In the name of the one who taught us all to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now let us remember the words of the Apostle Paul. Whatever is true and honorable and just, whatever is pleasing and pure and commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. And the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all days. Amen.